right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, it's about one minute after, and those who want to join us can can jump in. Um, all right. So I am Erica Fiola. I'm a director of grants and strategic initiatives at the Regional Arts Commission. Um, we are so thrilled um, to be here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and a very big thank you to those who completed the COVID-19 in, uh, COVID impact surveys, um, uh, which of course we're gonna be talking more about, um, but I know many of you participated and we're so grateful for that. Um, before we even get into the core of our webinar today, however, um, it is my honor to introduce um, the Regional Arts Commission's new president and CEO, Vanessa Cooksey. Vanessa comes to RAC with a wealth of experience and we are so excited for what's next under her leadership. Uh, Vanessa started in her new role just over a week ago, so she's still very much just getting settled, um, but I'd like to formally welcome her and turn it over to her for a quick welcome. Thank you so much, Erica. Hello, everyone. It is an honor and pleasure to be here and serve as the third leader of the Regional Arts Council. Uh, I've been a long time uh, supporter and patron of the arts and believe very deeply in our strategic plan and the work that we have set out for us. Uh, clearly we have some current challenges to overcome, but I'm very much looking forward to partnering with the amazing team that we have to address some of our key issues. So I look forward to engaging with you all and hope that you find the survey data that we're going to share today to be impactful and informative. Thank you. I'll turn it back to Erica. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so now we'll uh, sort of getting get into the bulk of the of the webinar today. So uh, the Regional Arts Commission embarked on an effort to collect data from both arts organizations as well as artists to help us gain a deeper understanding of how COVID-19 is impacting our local arts sector. Um, the data will be used to inform RAC's future programming in an effort to be as responsive as possible in this unprecedented and challenging time in service to our local arts sector. Um, this surveying effort closed about a month ago, just a month ago. So Liz has been diligently um, aggregating and analyzing the data and, in an effort to turn it around really quickly so that we could come back out to the community and share what we've learned. Uh, but because of this, we are still working through what RAC's future programming will look like specifically. So please stay tuned. We will continue our efforts to be as transparent as possible regarding any changes or updates to our programs moving forward. Um, okay, so I am joined today by Liz Dykeman, arts researcher and administrator who designed the surveys to facilitate this data collection effort on behalf of RAC. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Liz in just a, just a couple minutes, um, but I uh, want to first walk through just a, just a few housekeeping items. So first, we're using Zoom's webinar functionality. Um, if you've not used it before, you cannot unmute yourself or turn your camera on. If you're like me, you're probably very anxious <laughs> that people can hear you or see you, but I promise they cannot. <laughs> Um, if you have questions during this webinar, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will do my best to respond to anything that I'm able while Liz is presenting. Um, and we also have time at the end uh, for Liz to respond to any questions received as well. Um, and then again, I, I mentioned this previously, but my colleague Chloe Smith is the host. Um, and can manage any technical aspects of the webinar. So if you have any technical questions or issues, Chloe can jump in and help with those. Again, just put them in the Q&A box. And then I wanna make everyone aware that we are recording this webinar um, so um, that we can share it with anyone who may have missed it in the future. Um, finally, if anyone has any questions following the webinar, please reach out to me, Erica Fiola, at erica at racstl.org. Um, I'll put my email in the chat box as well, so you, so you can find it there. And if you have questions for Liz, I'd be happy to pass them along and get you the answers you're looking for. Um, okay, I think that's it for me. 
Um, so let me introduce Liz Dykeman. Um, Liz is currently pursuing her PhD from the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Um, she holds a master's of public policy administration and a BA in art history, uh, I'm sorry, yes, and a BA in art history. She's the co-founder of Midwest Artist Project Services, otherwise known as MAPS, um, which is a nonprofit that serves and empowers individual artists, collectives, and emerging arts organizations in the Midwest. Uh, Liz is also a 2012 Community Arts Training Institute alum, so Liz is a cat, which we're very proud of. Um, and so without further ado, please let, uh, help me welcome Liz Dykeman to talk more about the findings of our COVID-19 impact surveys. I'll start by saying a little bit about the agenda. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, organizational uh, survey findings first, followed by the artist survey findings. Um, and then share challenges and how to meet them between organizations and, and artists before uh, we're able to take questions at the end. Um, if you filled out either of the surveys, you know that they were very robust. There were lots and lots of data and findings that we collected uh, due to time restrictions, maybe especially now. Um, we're not going to be able to talk about everything, but we will be talking about the most important findings um, as they relate to the impact of COVID-19 on the arts community in St. Louis. So the purpose of both surveys was to gain a deeper understanding about the impacts of COVID-19 um, on the arts in the region to inform future programs and offerings at RAC. There were two surveys. Uh, the first was for organizations. The second was for artists. They were open between September 23rd and October 9th. Uh, there were four sections, common sections across both of the surveys. Uh, the first was background information, economic impact, programmatic and artistic impact, and then lastly, understanding and meeting challenges, which is that um, shared section that I talked about earlier. Participation was voluntary and responses are private and confidential. So everything you'll see um, here is reported out in the aggregate. Um, those that were eligible to participate in the surveys um, needed to have a primary address in St. Louis, in the St. Louis metropolitan region, which we defined as an eight county region. Um, artists need to be over the age of 19 and organizations needed to be arts or non-arts organizations, but they did need to produce arts and cultural activities. So first, like I said, we're gonna talk about the impact survey for organizations. So in terms of respondents, there were 152 respondents and almost um, all were located in St. Louis City and County. Um, it represents about one fifth of current registered um, arts and culture nonprofits in the region, which is a very good sample size. Uh, 45 different zip codes were represented with uh, 63103 being the most frequent, which is the Grand Center Arts District. Um, respondents were most likely to be tax exempt nonprofits and arts organizations. Um, about one sixth of respondents uh, were non arts organizations. And just for a little bit of clarity, when I say arts organizations, those are organizations whose primary mission is to produce arts and cultural activities. Non arts organizations do not specify uh, that their primary purpose is to produce arts and culture activities, but something else. So some examples of non-arts organizations um, that participated in this survey are youth mentoring and skill development, human services, and community improvement organizations. Um, other types of legal statuses um, of uh, participants were for-profit and commercial businesses. They made up just about 7% of respondents for the organization survey, um, unincorporated organizations and government agencies or departments. Uh, the most common uh, disciplines uh, that were reported by organizations were music, theater, multidisciplinary, um, visual arts and dance. So we see a lot of visual arts and performing arts in there. So it's not too surprising um, that a lot of respondents, uh, most respondents reported that their activities included performances followed by arts education, workshops, talks, and lectures. Almost all respondents uh, are working to advance DEI um, in their organizations in some ways. Some of the most common ways they are doing that are actively working to diversify leadership and staff, providing internships, mentorships, and resources uh, to underrepresented peoples in their field, and lastly, collecting demographic data for DEI purposes. And then 15.8, or about 24 uh, respondents, identified as Black-led organizations. Um, the most common characteristics of these organizations were that a majority of uh, their senior staff are Black or African American. Activities primarily present Black or Afri African American history, lived experiences, and or culture. 
and the executive director is Black or African American. And I do want to say that compared to all respondents, um, Black-led organizations are more likely to be non-arts organizations and to have a smaller budget size, specifically budgets of less than $100,000. So when you look at respondents by size, um, you know, you see that most respondents have budgets under $100,000. I'll follow by that 100,000 to just under the quarter million dollar mark. Um, this is pretty representative of registered arts nonprofits in the region. I do have to say though that it does lean a little bit towards the larger nonprofits. Um, most nonprofits, um, I should say registered nonprofits, arts and culture nonprofits in the region are small. Um, this uh, survey respondents here we're actually much more representative of the population in the region um, than the previous AFTA survey that we've talked about before. When we look at economic impact, the total economic, estimated economic impact is $35.8 million. So that is the sum of revenue loss and increased expenses or unexpected expenses. Um, nationally, total economic impact per organization is $30,000, and here in St. Louis, in the St. Louis region, it's about $35,000. Given that these are estimates, um, I think that they are pretty comparable numbers, especially since we don't know the margins of errors and say our estimates. So I think that, you know, what we're seeing nationally is reflected locally and vice versa. Um, clearly, the bulk of, you know, economic impact is from revenue loss. Almost all respondents uh, reported revenue loss, 92.1%. Median revenue loss per respondent was $30,000. Um, and the top five most common decreases in revenue types uh, were earned revenue, followed by government or public charity grants, individual donations, corporate donations, and then lastly, in-kind donations. I will say that decreases in revenue types do not vary significantly uh, by Black-led organizations or by size, really. Um, there is one exception in that the largest organizations, particularly those with budgets of $10 million or over, uh, were less likely to re report drops in individual and corporate donations. Um, the survey, uh, when we looked at, pardon me, increased expenses, about one quarter of respondents uh, reported increased expenses. The median increased expenses per respondent was $10,000. Of those that experienced increased expenses, they were most likely to report increases in the cost of cleaning and sanitation and health related items, followed by technology and then cancellation fees. Um, I will also say something that's notable is that even though black led organizations make up only 15% of respondents, they accounted for almost one third of the increased expenses. So they are disproportionately um, incurring increased expenses because of COVID-19. Um, you know, there are about 2.6 of respondents are not certain that their organization will survive the impact of COVID-19, uh, but most believe that they are likely to survive. I do want to point out in the AFTA survey, uh, the Americans for the Arts um, COVID um, impact survey that we've discussed in the past or at the previous presentation, um, is that if you look at the findings from that survey, which most recipient or pardon me participants filled out in March and April versus today there's actually um, an increased percent of organizations that believe um, they're going to be able to weather the storm um, actually six times more so I think that over time to me it seems like expectations of survival are actually improving and then lastly for each section we did ask an open-ended question um, so that participants could share anything that we may not have asked about um, especially here in terms of economic impact. Um, some themes that rose to the top in this question uh, was a, unsurprisingly, I think, financial hardship. A lot of organizations making do uh, with less at this point in time. Um, and also, you know, being, feeling like they're in a very precarious uh, position, not knowing um, when they're gonna be able to return to, you know, producing the kinds of activities that they have in the past. Um, next is reimagining organizations and programs. Quite a few people uh, did discuss how they were really putting, you know, they're trying to be innovative and flexible and think about how their programming um, can move online or in other ways make sure that they're adapting to the times. And then lastly, some participants did talk about pri prioritizing relief efforts. So um, especially for Black-led or small organizations, 
um, you know, seeing that there's potentially greater need for those, uh, those organizations in the region. And now we're going to look at job losses in terms of economic impact. Um, you know, so we're looking at three different types um, of employment, if you will. So independent contractors, part-time, and then full-time employees. Uh, clearly, the largest losses were among contra or independent contractors. And when I say independent contractors, those were defined on a legal basis and includes local and non-local artists, seasonal workers, and expert, you know, consultants. Um, there was a 12.2 decrease in full-time employees and a 1% decrease in part-time employees um, from January to September. Uh, median losses per respondent for full-time employees was two, part-time was three, and then independent contractors was 10. So as I said earlier, you know, the bulk of the um, losses were contra independent contractor work. 12.5% um, of respondents reported laying off or furloughing full-time employees. Um, just a little bit more reported laying off or furloughing part-time employees but over 60% of participants reported canceling or postponing independent contractor work due to COVID-19. Um, in the AFTA survey, uh, there were twice the proportion of respondents who were using financial reserves and respondents were much less likely to cancel or postpone contractor work. So again, if we're able to look at that in terms of um, long longitudinal change, I think it's possible um, that that signals a different approach to dealing with the economic impact Impact of COVID-19 over time that, you know, you know, at first, um, maybe financial reserves uh, was how a lot of people were responding. And now um, it seems like contractor work is maybe something that's happening a little later on. Um, when asked how respondents were responding to the economic impact of COVID-19, most said, like I, unsurprisingly, that they are postponing or canceling contractor work. Um, they were also likely to apply for Federal CARES Act funding use financial reserves, um, or try to improve or increase their fundraising efforts. Um, I will say that when you look at Black-led respond organization respondents, um, they reported very similar um, actions due to COVID-19. We're gonna look at economic impact by size. Um, and I know this is a lot of numbers on the screen, so we're gonna start with the left-hand column and work towards our right. Uh, so when we look at revenue loss, you know, as expected, Revenue loss increases with the size, uh, with the largest respondents, those especially budgets of $10 million, uh, reporting the bulk of revenue loss. For increased expenses, um, they actually do not increase the size. Organizations with less than $100,000 make up almost one third of the total increased expenses, right behind organizations with budgets between one and $4.9 million. Um, again, black-led organizations account for a disproportionate amount of total increased expenses. Um, when we look at, you know, the economic impact in terms of employment, uh, larger organizations were more likely to have higher full-time and part-time employee losses, that is, uh, laying off or furloughing employees part-time or full-time, um, you know, especially organizations of budgets of from five to $9.9 million. And then that's simply, I think, because they employ more of these workers than smaller um, organizations. Um, the obvious exception is organizations with budgets of $10 million or more, which reported, reported no full-time or part-time employment losses. Um, in, the, in the survey, these organizations were more likely to cite that uh, they, were, they were responding to the economic crisis by reducing salaries and benefits. So potentially between that and maybe their financial resources, they haven't had to make those sorts of changes yet. Uh, when looking at in independent contractors, uh, the story is much different. Um, it's a U-shaped curve. So we see the largest losses for the largest organizations, budgets of $10 million or over, um, and for the smallest organizations, organizations um, with budgets of under $100,000. Um, and I think that this is probably one of the best metrics for employment um, impact because, you know, I think that compared to full-time and part-time staff, any size organizations are more likely to employ contractors. Um, you know, I will say that when we look at how organizations are responding, um, clearly there's a lot of organizations that are contracting or postponing um, contractor work. Um, small organizations in particular though, are more likely to use their financial reserves. Larger organizations are more likely to try to improve or increase fundraising efforts or apply for CARES Act funding. 
Um, and I would say across the board, um, there's a pretty similar amount, um, regardless of size, that are looking at canceling and postponing contractor work, like I said, reducing overhead expenses, um, and uh, doing hiring freezes. Looking at programming impact, um, the majority of respondents are doing some sort of online arts and cultural activities. Um, what's interesting is that about one in two respondents, about half of them, are currently trying to earn income from online activities, but only about one quarter are actually satisfied with their ability to do so. So I see this um, as really, you know, intent and ability aren't necessarily matching here. I will say that there were many more respondents who are interested in earning income right now, but maybe not trying to earn income. Um, there were a few respondents who made pretty clear and open-ended questions and otherwise that, you know, it's taking them a lot of time and resources uh, to build out these online programs and that, you know, they're about ready to start that or getting there. So I would anticipate that, you know, many more organizations are going to be trying to earn income um, down the line. Um, you know, three quarters of um, respondents report challenges in earning income um, from online arts and cultural activities. Some of the top challenges um, that they're running into right now are lack of sales, donations, and earned income from programs, difficulty moving in-person programs online, low attendance, um, and lack of technical knowledge or skills, and then lastly, uh, limited audience or participant engagement. And those are things that you're going to be hearing me say throughout this presentation. Um, again, we have an open-ended question here uh, where we asked organizations to share a little bit about programming impact that we might not have um, specifically asked about. Um, you know, a lot of organizations talked um, about the difficulty in reaching their audiences, um, particularly those that are working um, with youth or seniors. Um, and a lot of um, people were really concerned about the digital divide and how that's going to impact or how that is impacting um, different populations' ability to access um, or engage with online arts programming. Because obviously, if you don't have reliable internet access, it's going to be very difficult to participate in arts programming um, as it's increasingly online. Um, technical and marketing challenges also rose to the top. Um, quite a few organizations talked about um, specific needs or specific challenges they face um, in putting um, any sort of activities online. Um, and then lastly, different impact that, you know, because there's been this huge pivot uh, to producing arts and cultural activities online, um, organizations are trying to figure out what their impact look, looks like now, because obviously it's going to be different um, than in-person attendance at any of their programs. And then for programming impact, uh, we asked about how COVID-19 is impacting the artistic quality um, of arts and cultural activities for all respondents. Um, generally, small and mid-sized organizations, but especially organizations with budgets under $100,000, were more likely to report the highest decreases and increases in artistic quality of activities. Um, by comparison, the larger the organization, the more likely they were to report no change on each item. Uh, there are two items of special note, I think, for increases among those small nonprofits. Um, one was attracting and retaining audiences. They had above, um, re, uh, pardon me, all respondents, they reported above all respondents uh, being more successful or increased, pardon me, um, as well as budget setting goals and evaluating activities. Um, I will say the only exception was offering distinctive and unique activities in which there was kind of this U-shaped curve um, that favored larger organizations. Um, that is to say that mi uh, mid-sized organizations really had mixed results. Um, but I know overall, oh, pardon me, I also want to say really quickly that black lay nonprofits like small nonprofits uh, seem more likely to report increased artistic quality of activities, especially offering distinctive and unique activities. Um, on every item, black lay organizations reported increased almost twice as much as all respondents. Um, Really quickly, though, I do want to say that, you know, while there are some increases that we can point to for small organizations and black led organizations, that is to say they're still pretty small. You know, the story that this graph tells um, as you move from left to right is obviously a story of decrease that overall and on the whole artistic quality is decreasing due to COVID-19 for all organizations. 
And then next, uh, we did ask about community benefit and the impact of COVID-19 on community benefit of organizations. Um, again, the story here are large decreases. And I think what's important to note is that respondents reported larger total declines in community benefit than artistic quality, um, with one exception. And that was small organizations with budgets of less than $100,000 reported a slightly higher total increase for community benefit. Um, by when we look at analysis by size, uh, results seemed a little bit more mixed for community benefit than artistic quality. Um, they do follow some of the same general patterns or trends that we saw uh, for artistic quality, which is to say that small and mid-sized organizations kind of had that dichotomous response where we see, you know, really sharp um, or the highest, I should say, increases and decreases. Um, well, the larger the organization, the more likely they were re to report no change. Um, small nonprofits did have some notable increases um, in terms of reaching underserved neighborhoods and reaching underserved individuals. Um, the two largest size categories did not report um, any increases for three of the four items. The only exception was um, reaching underserved individuals. Um, and when we look at analysis by black led organizations, uh, they did not differ significantly from the overall results. Um, but again, we see a story of um, decrease here in terms of community benefit um, as organizations um, you know, are weathering the storm and turning to online programming during COVID. So now we're gonna look at the artist survey findings. We're gonna start by uh, talking just a little bit about the respondents. There were 272 respondents. Um, and again, most lived in St. Louis City and County. Um, the top five most common artistic disciplines were visual arts, theater, craft and traditional arts, and literature. Um, you know, the, these um, they sh artists, I should say, share um, some of the most common artistic disciplines with organizations, that is visual arts, music, and theater. Uh, the majority of respondents were female. Um, One-tenth have a sensory mobility or learning uh, concentration impairment. And about half of all respondents are between the ages of 30 to 49, and about one-fifth are 65 years or older. When we look at respondents by income, um, you know, of almost one third um, of respondents earn less than $25,000. Uh, for reference, um, the median um, income in St. Louis City is $41,000 and $65,000 in St. Louis County. Um, so at least by the standards of St. Louis County, um, artists are clearly making below uh, median income. Um, also 42.4% of respondents will run out of savings and not be able to afford basic living expenses. Uh, by the end of the year. Only about one-fifth have six months or more of savings. When we look at respondents in terms of race and ethnicity, um, we very clearly have a large proportion of white respondents. Um, I think it's important to note that compared to the Artist Relief Fund um, and also other uh, grant programs, um, white people are overrepresented in the survey while well, Black and Asian people are underrepresented. The survey does not represent the group of artists who typically engage with RAC through grants or in other ways. Um, and I do wanna note that while the survey does not represent Black or Asian populations in St. Louis City, um, it actually looks not too far off from the demographics of St. Louis County, uh, which is 67.9% white, 25% Black or African American. Um, also, it is fairly representative of the city and county's Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish population. Um, and lastly, due to an unrepresentative sample of Black or African American respondents, analysis by race was not conducted uh, for fear that it would be uh, not reliable. And when we look at economic impact specific, specifically on artistic practice, um, again, we see that this is the total of revenue loss and increased expenses. The total estimated economic impact was $2.7 million. Um, and the median total economic impact per respondent is $7,000. And I think you really need to put that number into context. So when you think about most respondents making under $50,000, that means that total economic impact could range from 15% uh, to 30 or even north of that. Like these are pretty significant impacts when you think about it uh, for individual artists. 
Uh, when we look at revenue loss, almost three quarters of respondents reported revenue loss from their artistic practice. Median revenue loss per respondent was $8,000. Cancellation, loss or postponement of existing work, lack of new work opportunities, and decreased sales or donations were the most common reasons are decided for a revenue loss. Uh, when we turn to increased expenses, one fifth of respondents reported increased expenses. Median increased expenses uh, were about $1,000 per respondent. Of those that experienced increased expenses, uh, they reported increases in the cost of technology, marketing and promotion, cleaning, sanitation, and health related items, and then lastly, cancellation fees. Um, I will say that six in 10 respondents applied or received some type of COVID-19 relief funding. And now we're going to turn a little bit and look at arts related work and non arts related work. And just to clarify, when I say arts related work, um, that was any type of employment that was in the arts field, but not um, specifically your artistic practice. So that would be um, arts administration jobs, arts education, or some type of uh, technical um, employee. Non arts work was, as you could imagine, anything else, you know, your job at the library or grocery store, or whatever it may be. Um, when we look at changes in employment, uh, respondents are more likely to experience changes in employment for first their artistic practice, followed by arts related work, and then non arts work. Um, that is all to say that, for lack of a better word, the more artistic your employment, the more likely it is to be impacted by COVID-19. Um, and across all three types of work, um, respondents are most likely to experience cancellation or postponement of contractor work, uh, followed by a reduction in pay and hours. One third of respondents did report uh, lack of work opportunities. But I just want to point out that this really mirrors what we saw earlier with organizations that, um, you know, their largest employment losses were uh, for independent contractors and we're seeing here on the flip side for artists um, that their largest employment changes were cancellation or postponement of contractor based work. Uh, lastly, I want to say there was a drop in the median and average percent of annual income derived from the artistic practice and arts related work from January to September, um, it was a median percent change of about 10%, um, which is pretty significant. And when we look at artistic impact, we did ask about how artists are faring right now in terms of how much time they're spending on their artistic practice and if there have been any changes uh, due to COVID-19. Um, as you can see, the majority of people said that their, uh, the time they spend on their artistic uh, practice decreased um, about half of respondents. Of those spending less time, about half reported a 40% or less drop in the hours that they spend. Uh, the decrease in time was primarily due to lack of work opportunities, feeling unmotivated, um, physical or uh, mental health concerns, caretaking for others, and then lastly, lack of access to studio or artistic materials. Uh, we do have, you know, about a, a, what, a, pardon me, a quarter um, of respondents did say that they increased their time in the studio uh, due to COVID-19. Um, and it was a similar uh, proportion that said they were, uh, pardon me, it was they were spending similarly more amount of time um, compared to who they, those who were spending less time. So about 40%, um, we're looking at about 40% increase in the amount of time that they're spending in the studio. Um, and the reasons they cited for increased time uh, was decreasing other responsibilities to process and reflect, generate income from their artistic practice, and then lastly, desire to produce art for others. Um, you know, many respondents are currently trying to earn income from online arts and cultural activities, but less than one quarter are satisfied with their ability to do so. Um, similarly to organizations, uh, three quarters of respondents um, said that they were interested in earning income. Um, and also, you know, I think it's important to note that for both organizations and artists, we have this again division between um, intent and ability that, you know, there's a high percentage of artists and organizations trying to earn income from online arts and cultural activities, um, but not a large amount that are satisfied with their ability to do so. Um, also, I should say that the top challenges um, that artists uh, uh, reported and producing online activities uh, were uh, kind of similar to organizations again. You know, marketing and promotion, limited audience or participant engagement, lack of donations or sales. 
Um, so the two challenges that overlap with organizations are lack of sales, donations, and earned income, um, and then limited audience or participant engagement. Uh, so we're seeing that across the board. Uh, the top issues impacting artists right now um, are lack of studio or creative space, followed by food and utilities, health insurance, housing, other, and student loans. When I look at these top issues for artists, you know, I think that it's important to, again, return to um, you know, the economic, um, pardon me, their income. And you know, as we saw earlier, they're low earning, on, for the most part, lower median income than most in the region. And now we're facing significant uh, rates of you know, unemployment and revenue loss. So I think, for me at least, it kind of follows that the items that are considered most important are those that we also sometimes talk about as basic needs, like food and utilities, health insurance and housing. Um, uh, lastly, I should say that, you know, again, we asked this open-ended question about um, artistic impact and how it's impacting artists right now. Uh, there was, again, a lot of uh, respondents talking about a decrease or increase in art making or creativity, um, very similar to what we just talked about. Um, you know, citing decreases due to caretaking, um, lack of motivation, anxiety, stress. Um, increases were typically due to urgency to address political, the political climate. Um, and then lastly, financial and emotional struggle. Um, many artists reported um, that, you know, they're, since COVID has begun, um, they've felt an immense amount of financial pressure um, and are really uh, struggling emotionally and financially at this point in time. So we're going to turn now to looking at shared um, challenges that artists and organizations face. Um, I should say that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of overlap here. Um, a lot of artists and organizations are experiencing the same sorts of challenges and see that the same sorts of items are going to help them meet those challenges. So when we look at understanding challenges, um, we asked, you know, what are the top challenges you face due to COVID-19? Um, as you can see, we have organizations on the left and artists on the right. Um, you know, there were three shared challenges. Uh, the first was reduced earned income. And, you know, that's across, you know, looking at grant awards or, you know, earned income from non-arts work or arts related work. Um, difficulty planning and or decision making due to uncertainty. That was a common theme throughout the survey, especially in open ended questions um, where organizations and artists talked about how it's been a struggle to get to here, you know, it's September of 2020, and they're not sure how they're going to continue to make it for the duration of COVID-19. Uh, and then the third shared challenge was reopening, operating, or producing arts and cultural activities or artwork safely. And looking at how organizations thought that they could best meet these challenges, um, again, we saw a lot of overlap between organizations and artists. Um, so, I think, unsurprisingly for everyone here, um, the top one was financial resources, uh, followed by consulting, and then there was a split um, for third place between artists and organizations, uh, organizations citing administrative assistance and artists citing trainings and workshops. Um, you know, I'm not surprised to see financial resources at the top of this list. I was a little surprised to see consulting as a second for both, but it makes me wonder a lot about how um, organizations really want to be able to maybe work one-on-one -on -one and be able to address their individual challenges at this point in time. Um, I also want to point out that there were a few organizational respondents who made it very clear that they were not interested in trainings and workshops. Um, they often discuss that there are a lot of trainings and workshops available to them through their professional associations or otherwise, and that that wasn't the top of the list of um, how they thought they could best meet their challenges. Now we're going to dive into a little bit more into how to meet those challenges. So for the first one, uh, financial resources, um, we can see that there is obviously a major interest in just general operating funds for either organizations or our artists. Um, you know, I think that that's not too surprising thinking about, you know, right now the flexibility of those funds provide and, and potentially the need to cover overhead. Um, and other types of expenses for both artists and organizations. Uh, second was project-based funding for both as well, followed by capital project funding for organizations, low interest loans, um, and then for artists, low interest loans, and then uh, fiscal sponsorship. 
um, consulting was the second shared um, way that both organizations and artists saw they can meet their biggest challenges. Um, you know, I think that, again, we see some uh, common themes here, right? There's a real interest in trying to increase income, um, whether that be, you know, earned income or donations. Um, there's also real interest in marketing, branding, and promotion for both artists and organizations. Um, something I did want to point out, too, for organizations, and we talked about at the very beginning of this presentation, um, is that a lot of organizations right now are actively working on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So seeing diversity, equity, and inclusion show up as, you know, as number five on the organization list, um, I don't think is too surprising. And then lastly, we're going to diverge a little bit here. So administrative assistance was what um, organizations cited as the third way they thought they could best meet their challenges. Um, and some of the topics were, um, that floated to the top for organizations in terms of administrative assistance um, pardon me, administrative assistance, um, was fundraising and development, marketing, promotion, and branding, and information technology. So again, those are not new. We've been seeing those across different types of ways, um, different types of challenges and different ways that organizations think they can best meet those challenges. And then lastly, were trainings and workshops. And again, this was for arts, um, artists only, not for organizations. Um, and again, we see a real consistency with consulting topics and just general findings throughout the survey. Um, there was a real interest in increasing income, earned donations, or pardon me, earned income, donations, et cetera, um, followed by marketing, promotion, and branding. Um, I will say though that number three is mutual aid for artists. And for those who may not be familiar with the idea of mutual aid, it's when communities take on the responsibility for caring for one another, oftentimes through voluntary and reciprocal exchange of resources and services for mutual benefit. Um, I did think that was pretty interesting that that rose to the top um, and made me think a lot about, you know, artist um, ability or inability right now to network and have meaningful relationships with their peers. All right. I feel like I, I flew through that, but um, that is the bulk of our findings. Um, and I am happy now to take any questions that you might have about anything that I just presented on um, in terms of findings for organizations and artists. And Liz, there are two questions in the chat, in the Q&A, and I can read them if you'd like. Sure. Um, so one is, why does Liz think Black-led organizations have higher COVID expenses specifically and higher expenses generally? So I don't know if we got any context on that in particular. Yes, so it, I, I, don't, I don't think that that's what the data says. So what I did is I analyzed um, increased expenses by Black-led organizations versus all respondents. Um, they have, they're accounting for almost one third of increased expenses. So that's not what I think, that is what um, was reported um, and analyzed within the survey findings. And I wanna point out too, that there is a difference between you know, total expenses and increased expenses in this uh, survey. When we're talking about increased expenses here, those are typically, again, relating to things like um, increased expenses for um, sanitation or cleaning items or health related items. Um, technology, um, and I believe the other one was cancellation fees. I hope that answers the question. Okay, great. And then the, the next one is, um, do you have any sense of what the 25% of organizations who were satisfied with their online revenue were looking for? So I we did ask um, for those organizations that reported that they were satisfied or extremely satisfied um, with their ability to earn income from online activities to share a little bit more about, um, about their successes or about how they believe they're being effective. Um, I will admit that since one, there were so few of those people who cited, who reported that. Um, and two, you know, not everyone, it was a voluntary response question, so not everyone filled it out. A lot of folks who did, though, did talk about how, you know, they were spending a lot of time um, investing or building out um, and really being, I think, strategic about how they were launching um, or producing their online activities. Um, there wasn't, though, I would say any clear um, kind of finding around what makes them more successful um, or any clarity around, um, you know, it, um, I think much more than that. It was a little bit of a general response. 
Great. Okay. Thank you, Liz. That's all that's in the Q&A box at the moment. If there's any other questions, please do put them in. We have about four minutes left, so um, we'd be happy to answer anything about the, the survey data um, that people might be interested in. And then, like I mentioned too, if there's other questions, you know, if, if you're like me and you, you know, wake up in the middle of the night thinking about, <laughs> thinking about the data, you can always reach out to me, uh, Erica Fiola at Erica at RACSTL.org. Um, and I will follow up and get you what answer, whatever answers you're uh, interested in. Okay. Oh, all right. So Jenny Murphy, how will RAC use this data to inform decisions moving forward? So I will take that one. Let me start my video and see. So you're not, um, I don't know, Chloe, if you can unspotlight Liz. Okay. Oh, well, here I am. Um, all right, Jenny, good question. So yeah, so we are right now, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, reviewing all of this data and uh, again, trying to figure out what ways RAC can um, be responsive uh, and in support of our local arts sector. Um, really the goal of doing this survey was to help us um, do just that and inform um, our programs, both our grant making and, and you know, our other strategic initiatives programs that we do. Um, so th that's the work that we're, we're going through right now is, um, you know, looking at how we can support the community in 2021. So I promise more to come. I know that's sort of a vague answer, um, but we will continue to be transparent and we'll likely do, um, you know, more webinars or Zooms in the future to continue that conversation. All right, what else? Anything else? All right, well, we have two minutes left. I don't see anything else coming through. Um, so uh, I just, I definitely wanna thank everyone for being with us today um, and, and bearing with us through our um, technical challenges um, in this new world in which we live uh, virtually. Um, but um, I was, I'm, I'm so uh, grateful for you all uh, being here and for everyone who completed the survey. Um, again, please follow up if there's anything else that you have questions about or, or want to let us know. Um, and then thank you so much to Liz for all of her fantastic work. Um, and yeah, and welcome to Vanessa, Vanessa's first public meeting. So um, with that, I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you.